You're listening to The Business Communicators, presented by IABC Houston. And now your hosts, Austin Stepp, Hattie Horn, and Thomas Bain. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 25 of The Business Communicators, a podcast presented by IABC Houston. My name is Austin Staten, joined alongside my co-host this week, Thomas Bain, Hattie Horn, and we are welcoming you on this journey as we explore all the key issues and trends that impact us as communications professionals. And of course, we are the, uh, the number one podcast for business communications out there. It's a verifiable fact. So we thank you all for listening to this podcast. But Thomas, it looks like we've got a great sense of style uh, this week. You know, we are uh, both wearing the, uh, the same color shirt. And I don't know, we didn't call Hattie and let her know beforehand, unfortunately. Yes, all right. I won't take it personally. <laughs> When we were prepping for this, uh, the, the, this this recording, what was going through my head was literally that scene in The Devil Wears Prada, where it's just a blue shirt. No. This started years before. Don't know that. I've never seen Devil Wears Prada. Ooh, you're missing a classic. <laughs> Meryl Streep and Hathaway? Ooh. About the, about the, the advertising and, and uh, fashion industry communications? Stanley Tucci. So is it better than Emily in Paris? Oh, anything is better than that one. <laughs> you said you <laughs> like the show. I kind of like it. I so like it's mindless the... entertainment, I guess, is what. Yes, There's yes. a difference between liking it and then it's going to have on in the background. Liking it. <laughs> we're going to talk tape. a little bit. Of, we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit about uh, streaming here in a few moments. And we've, we're also going to talk about big tech uh, some of the companies, some some legislation that's going on in Florida. We're also going to talk about Zoom and whether or not we should end video calls a year after it seems like everyone has been in on them. But uh, before we dive into anything, uh, we want to make sure that you follow us on all of our social media platforms. Just search at Biz Communicator. We're on everything. You can also visit our website, the Business Communicators. Dot com. We'd also want to uh, thank our sponsors for supporting the show. That's Pierpont Communications, Mike Grants & Co., and IBC Houston. But, Thomas, let's start things off with Amazon. And I, I swear it's we're not, we're not an Amazon podcast. We don't talk about Amazon every single week. But Amazon seems to be in the news. And uh, this past week, there had been tons of rumors going around that Amazon was maybe trying to uh, buy MGM. And they pulled the trigger. So Amazon bought MGM, which is the like legacy movie company, for eight point five billion dollars, and it's the second largest acquisition that Amazon has ever made, second to only the Whole Foods purchase, what four, five, six, seven years ago. But it's the first time a tech company has bought a legacy media giant. And so Thomas, you were the one that that wanted to discuss this. Uh, for this episode of the podcast, I mean, what does this mean for how we stream, how we consume media, and Amazon overall? I think it's it's a lot bigger than just how we stream because Amazon's reality is just trying to buy more subscribers or more watchers to Amazon Prime to compete with the Netflix and to compete with the the Peacocks and and HBO Maxes etc. Et um, but what, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about Amazon is they're also a web-based service company. They're also an advertising company. Um, they, they break in billions of dollars a year on just advertising alone. And so any way they can tie their product back to something that people are watching is, is there. It's all over the news. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos has gone on record saying, uh, saying I want to create the next Game of Thrones. Um, and, and he's also stepping down in a month, month and a half from this this uh, this podcast. So is this his final final curtain call to say, look, we're now going to be a media company on top of a retail seller, on top of a cloud computing company, on top of an advertising company? I, I, I think it's going to be interesting um, to see what they do with it, if they're going to kind of let MGM do its own thing, or if they're going to start slowly moving in Amazon-branded products into the movies that are in the works. That's interesting when you, when you do see those branded plays like you're you're watching um gosh what was it back to the future you know that was the first really branded video or vi- branded ad that you see like in a in a movie they they were trying to plug the new vhs you know camcorder and that was something that we started to see now with like product placement and advertising so i i do think that's going to be an interesting angle but it's kind of interesting. Morning Brew had a, uh, a line in there, and they say, MGM's iconic mascot reflects the movie studio's blockbuster content catalog. And then it says, featuring franchises such as Legally Blonde. That was the first one that they mentioned. And then the second one they mentioned is James Bond. I, I, 
I didn't know Legally Blonde was that popular. I would maybe switch them around just a little bit. I don't know. James Bond has been going on since, what, the 1960s, 1950s? Um, But then, you know, the article goes on to say that, you know, that content maybe will go over to Amazon Prime. Hattie, what's your what's your take on this? Is this the uh, is this a good move by Amazon to diversify its portfolio, if you will? Amazon is just like anybody else. So, yes, I do think it's a smart move. One thing is also caters to their customers in terms of choice. Uh, What I find very interesting is also how movie studios, not only when they release their movies in the theater, they release they release them also on Amazon Prime. So they're giving people choice, whether you go sit in the theater or you can um, watch that movie on Amazon or something like that, uh, because it just it's just a way to not only bring in, you know, keep their existing companies, customers, but they bring in new customers as well. I use Amazon Prime religiously. And I watch, you know, the food. I order things off of Amazon. So, yeah, I do think it's a smart move. I, I would have done it. It's a hefty price to pay, you know, eight, eight, eight point two billion dollars And it's interesting because Hattie, like you, and I, I assume Thomas, you know, I have Amazon Prime as well. And I mostly think of it as, you know, you get the discounts at Whole Foods, you get uh, two-day free shipping, and it's great. But a lot of people almost forget that they have a subscription to Amazon Prime TV. And I would say that when you're looking at the streaming platforms, historically they have had some amazing shows on Prime TV, but the quantity of quality shows isn't there. It's it's not the same as a Netflix, which specifically is a company that is dedicated to producing content that is meant for streaming. Amazon is not that company, but I think this play with MGM potentially allows them to do. But I do want to you know, kind of pose a question to both of you. You know, I think streaming companies were such a big deal in 2020 because, well, except for Quibi, but <laughs> I, I think that part of the reason was during the pandemic, you know, people couldn't go out, restaurants, bars, uh, traveling, they were all closed for, for the better part of, of last year. So people were at home watching these streaming platforms. And as the country begins to reopen, I'm curious if these platforms are going to be sustainable in terms of their growth, especially when you have more and more competition. You know, it it used to be just Netflix and they were the only players in the game. Now you've got Disney Plus, Discovery Plus, Paramount Plus, so many options out there. So is is this going to be, I mean, streaming's not going anywhere, but is it going to make the market too crowded? I believe streaming is here to stay. So no, I don't think it's too crowded. Competition is competition. However, I did read somewhere that it creates competition among those streaming services uh, based on the amount of content they have and the quality of content. You just mentioned that Amazon Prime doesn't have a lot of really new content, but I also look at them as a, you also got to understand that Netflix has been around longer than all of them. Yep. So uh, now that there's competition on the, um, the competition for content, I believe they're going to build their content just like build more just like Disney plus and it like I said it gives people choice so it's going to be the consumer that is going to decide who they love the most um because Netflix when they they reported numbers I believe it was last quarter whatever their numbers did not go up anymore but they kept they stayed you know pretty stable whatever in other words they haven't grown anymore but they stayed stable so that's going to be depending on what new content they're going to be putting out because they rotate so much. You know, I, I'm not a huge fan of paying for cable. You know, the only reason why I pay for, for cable is so I can watch local sporting events. Like I want to be able to watch the Astros, the Rockets, and you have to have a specific cable package to be able to do that. If it wasn't for that, I, I wouldn't have, you know, cable because I, a lot of these shows, I, I like the a la carte options, right? That you can pick and choose what you want. Um, and sometimes it is a little bit frustrating when you're like, oh, man, I really want to watch a show on Disney Plus, but I don't really want to pay for a subscription. OK, I'll pay for it for a month so I can watch it. My concern, Thomas, is how many people are going to continue to have cable and have access to these like live local sports, which I think is important for a lot of folks versus paying, you know, $15 for Netflix, paying $10 a month for Disney or 
you know, for all of these streaming platforms, at what at what point are people going to finally say, all right, enough is enough. I'm, I'm going to stop paying for all these different services. What goes through my head is content is king, content is king, content is king. Um, meaning I've never that, heard you say that before on the show. I know. <laughs> never. Um, but, but then also to a competitor against MGM, uh, if you build it, they will come. Meaning that that if you have if you have the th- products that people want to buy, the products that people want to consume, in this case, movies, television, etc., people are going to go there. I don't think it is Amazon versus Netflix. I think it's Amazon versus Amazon. And what I mean by that is is we're in a professional organization. We're sponsored by ABC, great organization. And 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 when I was really actively involved with ABC, we also learned that a lot of our members kept memberships with other organizations, the American Marketing Association, another great organization, or PRSA, another great organization, um, because the content was similar, but there was enough differentiation. So so I don't know where that threshold is, is of the total package after you pay for your internet, after you pay your fifteen ninety nine for your Netflix, after you pay your $99 for your Amazon Prime, after you pay your $20 for your, your Disney Plus. Um, I, th- I think it's the overall package. Is at what point in time does the consumer think I'm spending too much money on this? My real concern, more than anything, is is so Disney a- a- has has their basic subscription, but then they have the, a tier up uh, subscription for like twenty five bucks, so that you can watch the movies as they're coming out in the movie theaters. Uh, my six year old really, really, really wants to watch one of the movies that comes out this week, so I'm like, okay, well, let's figure this out. So I'm wondering if Amazon's going to make that as a play, is that, yes, they have the Amazon Prime where you get a bunch of TV shows, movies, etc., but if they don't level it up for the MGM. Um, again, I'm really anxious to see what they're going to do with it. Are they going to just keep it as MGM, or are they going to you know start to Amazon? We discussed this earlier in the year about HBO Max, and HBO Max and, and Warner Brothers, they were releasing all of the 2021 films on HBO Max for a month, um, as, as they were released, but I don't know that, that play is sustainable for Hollywood long term, right? Uh, Hollywood can't afford to have people paying, getting a small, they're not getting the box office fees, right? So Hollywood needs to get people back into the theater. So I think that, you know, the Disney offering, you know, that extra package, uh, HBO Max doing the similar thing on when you can watch a movie the day it's released. I don't think that lasts beyond 2020, 2021. Uh, I, I just don't think it's, I think that's the future, but I think in the immediate near term, I don't think it's it's sustainable for, for Hollywood. Some of the streaming audiences are targeting certain audience, certain people. It's target audiences. Like I know Netflix has a lot of great content for black viewers and a lot of original content as well. Um, and they've kind of, to me, cornered the market on that for now. Whereas Amazon Prime, they're out, they're using, they have some original content, but not as much. And then there's some, like Disney Plus, they do a lot of the old school stuff uh, that we used to watch as when we were kids. And then they have a lot of new things too for kids, you know. So, in some cases, I think their target they have their target audiences and not just the, the content itself. With everybody having connected homes, you know, there are ways to tie back to what you're watching on TV, to what you're consuming on, on Amazon. And so I'm wondering if it's also a play into their advertising world of, hey, this, this customer likes uh, Rode microphones. I'm just looking at that because we have it right here. Um, but they also watch 007. So can we find other people who are 007 fans who are potentially going to get into podcasts? So we need to start showing them Rode microphones when they're online. You know they have so much data. I mean, Netflix has so much data on us already. So Amazon does already. And now that they can factor in this with streaming, it's, it's incredible. But I think it's going to be really interesting to watch. Uh, in, in the uh, the coming months, just to really see how you know they, they're able to compete uh, moving forward. But it's a huge acquisition again, eight point two billion dollars. Amazon acquires MGM, and it's the first time a tech company has bought a legacy media giant. But let's move on to a, a different topic, and this goes down to Florida. And I feel like uh, I don't know, weird stuff happens in Florida all the time. I mean, it's it's uh, if you type in like Florida man and then your birthday, it's it's <laughs> incredible the type of stuff that you can come up with. Um, yeah, just do that. Go ahead and pause this podcast right now. Type in and Google Florida man and then your birthday. 
look at the results. It's going to be crazy. And then unpause it, come back, and just enjoy the laughter. I, I don't know. But uh, this past week, Governor DeSantis and the, the state of Florida signed a, a bill. So it's SB 7072, and it restricts how large social apps, so you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and websites can moderate user-generated content. And this is something that we've kind of spoken about probably after the Capitol riots on, on January 6th. And at what point do you limit someone's access to these social media platforms to uh, maybe share misinformation, maybe share hostile information? At what point do you, like, cut these people off and, and moderate that content. So the state of Florida has basically said, look, you've got to protect the First Amendment, right? You've got to allow people, the social media is now a town center, so people can say whatever they want on there. Um, but at the same time, it leaves these companies potentially liable, uh, you know, for, for things that are done or said because of their platform. So two tech industry organizations sued Florida over its newly passed rules for social networks. And so NetChoice and the CCIA, which represents Amazon, Google, Intel, Samsung, Facebook, and other tech giants, said that the bill violates private companies' constitutional rights. They're asking a court to prevent the law from taking effect, calling a, a, a frontal assault on the First Amendment. So Thomas Hattie, who's right here? We, we talk about the cost, the, 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 the barrier to entry, the cost to entry. Back in the day, you know, it cost a lot of money to start a newspaper, to buy a newspaper. It cost a lot of money to start a... Start a television program or a news program and and to run it and to keep going you know the public access at 2 a.m were awesome to watch by the way um but it's free cheap easy to get a microphone to get a bullhorn by signing up for these social media platforms i think i think the social media and the united states and the world as a whole are still kind of trying to figure this whole thing out are they a news organization are they just a message board, for lack of a better statement? Um, and, and if you censor them, there's nothing to stop them from starting another message board, social media platform. And the list goes on for people that they find that, that you like. Um, I, I, just, I just hope that somebody will finally define what they want to do, fix the get the rules they want, and then stick to the rules. Not like, oh, I want this rule now, but then I'm going to change it for 10 seconds later. Oh, I want this rule now, but it's not servicing my needs, so we need to make it stronger. That's that's really where I'm taking come from. These platforms were created to connect people, to communicate with each other. That's the whole premises behind them. Similar to the, so now you're going to dictate what is communicated, who you connect to, and all of that. So while Florida the whole thing, they have a good point. I kind of get where social media is coming from. It's kind of gotten out of hand because they didn't have any real, think about it, policies to begin with. So now they're kind of, it makes it almost look like they're creating it as they come go along. That's exactly what they're doing. Depending, and every time something happens, okay, we've got to do this. Everything, they, it's almost like they didn't anticipate, well, they didn't, they didn't anticipate the type of crisis or any crisis that their platforms could create. It's so, almost like COVID. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's wild when you look at the original Facebook, you know, back in 2004, 2005. I mean, it was just limited to people with a .edu email address. And yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg envisioned Facebook growing, you know, and, and developing over time. I'm not sure that it, he could have imagined, you know, sitting in his dorm room in Harvard, that it would become what it is today. I, mean, I think he knew he was going to be successful, but I don't think he understood the magnitude that Facebook would have, you know, and its ability to, I don't know, hear voices from all over the world, whether they're meant for good, bad actors. And so it's like, at what point do you, do you limit those? And it, it's a tough position, especially because, Hattie, I, I fully agree with you. I think they are learning and adapting as they go. And I think that's okay. Um, I do think that they have done some things that are right. You know, like, I, I do think it's great to remove hate speech and all of that, like, false information on, on, on social media platforms. But I think sometimes there are issues 
you know, we've seen this, uh, The Hill actually reported that uh, Facebook this past week reversed its policy to allow posts speculating that COVID-19 was made at a lab. Um, you know, they, they were banning people. They were uh, removing posts for people that were posting information about this last year. And I think this is just like a larger piece on mem- misinformation is we have no idea where COVID came from, right? We don't know if it's if it was naturally occurring. We don't know if it came from a lab. We, we have no clue. But the problem was last year, President Trump ran with that theory that it was something that was leaked from a lab. And there were so many reporters out there that didn't like Trump and thought that he was only dealing in conspiracy theories because he had a track record of doing so. And uh, they, they were like, well, if, if Trump says it, there's no way it's it's possible. And now that he's out of office and China still hasn't been transparent, even Dr. Fauci has been saying, hey, look, this is a real possibility. Um, they don't know for sure. But to me, I, I think that sometimes social media companies, they're in a tough position, right? Because I think that they do have an obligation. You know, for, First Amendment rights don't exist on social media platforms. Like, you, you don't have the right to say whatever you want. It's not... It's it's not um, it, it's the same thing. Like if you say something stupid at your workplace, your company can fire you. Like you you could say whatever you want, but there are consequences for it. Uh, but I think sometimes these companies need to try to stay a while, stay out of the the political hot button issues, if you will, and and try not to take sides early on in the situation until all of the information is revealed. If that kind of makes sense, specifically regarding the COVID situation, if that makes sense. And and this goes back to what I was trying to get at more than anything is the media, newspaper televisions have regulations, you know, the, 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 the fair and balanced reporting that if it's an election cycle, one campaign gets X number of column inches or ad rates, the other candidate gets the same, same, same amount of coverage to make sure that both sides are getting heard. Social media, I think that if they're going to be selling ads, that needs to be part of the process. Not whoever has the biggest pocketbooks wins. Uh, but but being held liable, and I also think that, that Section 230, where the companies aren't technically liable for what anybody says on there. So I think that they're trying to prevent some of the things by trying to be proactive. But I, I, I think that they're kind of misguided. I, I, I agree with you, Austin, that they have a tough, tough place. I just wish that they would either pick a lane. Are we here to connect people? Are we here to be a news organization? Um, or are we here to do some sort of blended of both? And right now, there's, there's, they're just trying to do what's best for them, sell more ads. One of the big things um, we've learned along the way as a result of all the stuff that was sold on, um, put out on social media and uh, through the media and what have you, is through the Edelman Trust Barometer, is that nobody trusts anything the media says or the government, whatever, that they trust their CEOs and their companies. So if anything good came out of this is that, you know, companies should, you know, take advantage of the opportunities and how they communicate to their, their folks, their stakeholders, their employees. And so they're really more in a position to um, be the champion in terms of good information. I don't know if that's good or bad. Well, it is good. But it'll it'll be interesting to see how this really plays out in the end, because companies also use social media. Very, very much true. I, I do want to read a tweet, and this one comes from somebody named Sharon Sharon McMahon. I have no idea who she is. Mc, McCohen. I don't I don't know who she is. But I, I saw this retweeted back in April, and it says, "We are accountable for the information we repost. Something being said in an authoritative tone." with professional graphics doesn't make it true. Quote, I agree with it, so it's true, end quote, isn't the standard. If you don't have the ability, the time, or desire to verify, don't repost it. And I think that's a problem that we have today, is a lot of people see something on Twitter, they see something on Facebook, and they run with it because it's confirmation bias, right? It's it's something that supports their own belief system. And I have friends sometimes that will text me something, uh, you know, an article that they read, and I'm like, hey, you know, maybe maybe uh, that's not the right source. You know, maybe maybe you should dig a little bit deeper and actually understand what's being said. Because, you know, sometimes headlines are 100% clickbait. 
And sometimes people are trying to push a certain agenda. So you've got to do your research as well. And I would just encourage people uh, to do that. I think I think Twitter has started doing an interesting thing, which if, if I see a news article posted, it doesn't matter what publication, and I'm trying to retweet it without actually clicking on the article first, Twitter will give you a little notification saying, are you sure you want to reshare this without reading? And I think I think that's fascinating. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's gonna, going to be, you know, quite the ride. And I'm really interested to see where this goes. I'm only laughing because of what you said about when we prep for these shows, how many times that I know I'm guilty of, hey, this headline grabbed my attention and we'll read it later and figure it out. And y'all have been like, did you read that article? I'm like, no, why would I do that? <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I, I think I might have thought of a solution. Okay, so if you want to repost something, they should put a timer on, like a six-hour six hour timer that, that you have to come back and repost and see if you want to post it in six hours um, for, for the information cycle to kind of go through. It's one of those things, think before you speak, think before you retweet, think before you post. So similar to what Austin said, but all media companies should be like, okay, we know you want to repost this. Come back yeah, in six hours and we'll no. see if you really want to repost it. No, I don't think that's or, a good or, idea. Or, or in some cases, you know how when some information is put out there, they'll, uh, some uh, social media platform will put up, what is it, Snopes, that'll say uh, it's not verified or something like that. But if we all, and it's unfortunate that uh, we don't think like journalists are supposed to think, they're supposed to verify their information. Uh, was this verified before they publish something, at least that's what uh, editors used to uh, pound into, you know, their heads. And, and part of that is, you know, they're trying to be first rather than being mm-hmm. correct. Uh, and so that exactly. that's something that Accurate. happens. Yeah. And that also puts, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters of the world in a tough position. So mm-hmm. verify, verify your information. You know, I think, I think a solution would be to have everyone have verified profiles, right? You know, no more of this anonymous... <laughs> stuff you've got to put your actual name on a profile you've got to have your actual like photo you know it's got to be you've got to be able to match it because i don't know i think that would that would that would definitely take away a lot of this if you didn't because you've got so many people out there that are internet bullies and this is especially an issue on like message boards you know where you can have Mm -hmm. a, a screen name saying whatever you want and nobody knows who you are there's no accountability but when your name's attached to it, there's accountability. When your photo's attached to it, there's accountability. And, you know, I, I, I even had this conversation with a, a message board, um, Sikkim365, which is a, a Baylor sports message board. And there was some, like, awful, awful stuff being said probably about a year ago to the point where I, I ended up, like, canceling my subscription, posted some tweets about it. And the, uh, the owners, who I know, called me and they were like, hey, we wish you'd have talked to us first before posting it on Twitter. And I was like, no, this is bullshit. You know, you've got people who are posting inflammatory information and they are not even being, you know, the person that's going to put their name by it. And that frustrated the heck out of me. And they, they don't even block these people. And I said, you know, they asked me what the solution was. And I told them, look, I've got my name on there. My my name on the message board is at a statin. And they were like, well, some people want privacy. I was like, that's the problem. They're hiding behind the screen and you're not doing anything about it. So yep. that's the problem. That's my solution. I know that will never happen because people want that anonymity on social media. But if you really want to create change, that's the way to do it. Yeah. And stop manipulating the First Amendment. Yep, exactly. So anyways, thanks for coming to our TED Talk on this and social media. <laughs> we actually will be having a... Uh, you know, somebody from, from Facebook on uh, the podcast in the, the few weeks. So we are interested to, uh, you know, dive into the, some of these issues. We're also going to talk about, you know, small businesses as well, um, so which will be great for a lot of the entrepreneurs um, that listen to this podcast. But I do want to wrap things up with, uh, I guess, our, our, our Wednesday wisdom. So we're not going to use the writing prompt book, but we did see a story uh, that was posted. Gosh, I don't know which... I think it was PR week. So PR week had a headline and it was talking about zoom, zoom fatigue, and it posed a really interesting question. And so I I want to share this out to you and I want to hear your thoughts. So if you have any thoughts, comments, drop them in the notes below and the comments below, but the question for this week, is it time for the video called madness to end? 
Is it time for the video call madness to end? Hattie, I'm going to start with you. I, I think I mentioned earlier before we started the call that I was listening to a radio a program this morning and it had a celebrity guest on and he was talking about he started a new uh, project and he had as many as 45 Zoom calls scheduled in a day. And he said he was Zoomed out. Now, my whole thought on that is while the pandemic made it easier for us to meet using, you know, Zoom and Microsoft Teams, I, I think some of it did get out of hand. And But I put that sometimes on the owner because we need to be a little bit accountable about how we prioritize our time. Um, you have 45 Zoom calls. Did you actually have to have every single call on that day? No, you probably didn't, but you went along with it. Sometimes we can create some of the madness for ourselves because we don't know how to say no. And so my thought is, it's not a, limit your calls, prioritize, you know, what you're calling about and those kinds of things. Because that's what I do. If I don't want to talk to you, or if I don't have the time to do that, I'm going to make, I'm going to prioritize. It's no different from if you're sitting at work, you go into 55 meetings and you can't get any work done because somebody scheduled a meeting within your thing. What do you do? You block out stuff on your calendar so you can get some work done, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. That's what you do. Yep. I think that's incredibly important, Hattie. And, and my take on this is, one, I think people have too many meetings. You know, I, I don't think you need a 30-minute meeting. You can get it done in 15 minutes. Most of the time, you can get it done in email conversation or Teams chat or something like that. Um, but I don't understand why you have to keep doing video calls because... I think we're focused on productivity and making sure that we're being as productive as possible. And sometimes if you are not actively leading a call, you know, you can still listen. But I think when you have your camera on, you can't multitask, right? You can't, there are certain things that you can't do. So that maybe puts you further behind on the day. So you're not being as productive as you could be. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that I think it limits productivity being on, on video calls. Like I think sometimes there's a time and a place for them, but does every call need to be a video call? No. I also think you need to set boundaries, as Hattie alluded to. Like say no, uh, know the value of your time. But I think if you're a business leader, consider setting up a policy. And this is something that uh, Hattie and I's old company, BP, did well during the pandemic. I, I don't know if they still do this, but... They had a rule, at least in our team, that you couldn't have any meetings scheduled between 11 and 1 during the lunch hour. So you could use that time to go to lunch, run errands, work on things. Um, and it was great to have that two-hour block during the middle of the day. And I think more companies should do something similar, at least while you're working remotely. So Thomas, what's your take on this? Are video calls done, or do you do you love them? Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Um in all all facets of life I, I think back to the meeting to the to this t-shirt coffee mug another damn meeting that should have been an email um and, and then when you 45 zoom calls in a day i'm sitting there trying to do the math in my head and i'm like if he's doing 15 minute calls he's doing zoom for 11 plus hours if they're 30 minutes the guy doesn't sleep so i think person i think that guy might be exaggerating just a little bit just for the sake of it or or He's doing the cardinal sin, and he's got like three Zoom calls going on at the same time, which then he's being highly ineffective for all three of them um, all the way around. Uh, I think I think there's a time and a place for being able to look someone in the eyes and to say, hey, what's going on? We need to do this, X, Y, Z. You know, the flybys when your boss used to show up at your desk saying, where do we stand on X, Y, Z, making sure that you really are where you're supposed to be. But, but to Austin's point, there's certain meetings that why have the video on? You should just be listening. You're a passive participant in the meeting. A town hall meeting. Well, not town hall meetings. We pay attention to all our town hall meetings. Um, but but, but things that, that you're just there just to understand what's going on. I think the podcast is a beautiful thing because while we do record video and we show it on YouTube, you can actually get the same information while driving, driving, to, driving to work, listening to NPR, mm -hmm. um, even though we're way more engaging than NPR. Um, I we've know. proven that too. <laughs> we've proven that too when we pulled it up on the LinkedIn page that more people engage with our content than NPR. 
Yeah. The following count doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but to the point is, is we give our listeners the opportunity to engage and consume how they want to engage and consume. On the Zoom call, if your camera's on, you can't multitask. You know, but I am gonna I'm gonna make a little tangent here. Is so I'm so great that we have computers at our fingertips because I did have to Google uh, Florida man my birthday and I got Florida man jumps into crocodile pit just yeah. to put it in perspective. Yep. So, so, so my take is, is are they going away? No, I hope we do pull back a little bit on them. And I think that that probably will start to happen as we start to get more and more to the office. But I still think that they, they do serve a purpose. Very true. There's time and place for it, but also set boundaries. I think that's something really, really critical, especially if you've got like lunch meetings, like let people turn their cameras off to eat, you know, things like that. It's just something so simple. But when you mentioned Florida man, I typed in Florida man, May 30th, which is my birthday. And I got two that came back that are really interesting. So uh, one is his girlfriend was sleeping. So he used a cheeseburger to wake her up. <laughs> Uh, interesting. Uh, the other one is Florida man hits his sleeping roommate on head with a skillet for being a confidential informant. A lot of crazy stuff goes on in Florida. So. <laughs> that, is, you, that, that is so true. The Breakfast Club has what's called Donkey of the Day. And Charlemagne the God says, and most of his Donkey of the Days are people either from uh, Florida or the Bronx in New York. He says those are the craziest people. Fact check accurate but we hope we're not offending any florida listeners but i don't think we have anyone no. listening from florida so it's totally okay but if you are come on our podcast and explain to us why you are crazy <laughs> or not no i'm kidding joking there uh well anyways we hope that you enjoyed uh this episode of the business communicators podcast and of course if, if you have any comments feedback feel free to hit us up on social media just search at biz communicator on all the platforms of course you can visit our website the business communicators.com and of course thank you so much to our sponsors that's pierpont communications mike ranson co and ibc houston we couldn't do the show without you so uh, we hope that you had a great memorial day weekend and we hope that you are ready for the rest of the summer and uh, hopefully you've got some travel plans booked and you're ready to go and hopefully if you're vaccinated you get to enjoy, you know, not wearing a mask. But if you are not vaccinated, we highly encourage you to to get it done. That'd be a great move. So those are my parting words. Thomas Hattie, anything else to add? If those can, are the best parting words. If you can get vaccinated, do it for the people who can't. Yeah, exactly. So great words to close the show out. And uh, Hattie, next week, maybe Thomas and I will coordinate with you a little bit better so we can all wear the same color shirt. Uh, we'll, we'll see. So... <laughs> On behalf of my co-host this week, Patty Horn, Thomas Bain, my name's Austin Staten, and we'll see you next week. You've been listening to The Business Communicators. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a five-star review.